is in healthcare and biotechnology. Uh, as we gather here at the next uh, Human Tech meeting, we are about to embark on an extraordinary journey through the frontiers of science, philosophy, anthropology, uh, exploring the potential of extending uh, human life beyond the boundaries we always know. Uh, and uh, we invited a wonderful guest um, to talk about it. And Jennifer Huberman, Alexander Morozov, um, Joanna Andrusiewicz, and Jakub Zawiła uh, Niedźwiecki. Um, and before we um, before we go further, uh, let me let me switch uh, to Polish for a moment. Chciałbym powiedzieć, że jeśli państwo potrzebują, I would like to say, ladies and gentlemen, that if you should need interpretation. It will be made available uh, to you on the next slide. Uh, there will be a short information about how to, how to find interpretation. If look, if you click on the globe on your menu, you'll be able to choose Polish and hear interpretation to Polish. Also, if you have questions afterwards, you can ask them in Polish and we will uh, communicate them to our speakers. We can't promise you that all your questions will be answered, uh, but at least some of them. Regarding organizational issues, uh, as always, we have two lectures, and after this, these lectures, uh, we have a um, panel, discussion panel, um, and, and uh, of course, feel free to use our chat space if you have some questions uh, or comments, share your comments as well, write everything in the chat uh, space. And also I would like to thank our partners uh, and, and our uh, supporters, uh, our sponsors um, uh, headed by the Ministry of Science and Higher Education. Uh, so we extend our um, heartfelt thanks to our partners, sponsors, and uh, the esteemed members of our scientific committee uh, for their the invaluable uh, support. Um, without them, uh, such events, such proje project wouldn't be uh, possible. Um, uh, so as you can see here, we have our brilliant scientific uh, committee. Um, um, uh, as I said before, uh, today we have two speakers, and uh, let me um, introduce first speaker. Speaker, it's my privilege to introduce Alexander Morozov. Uh, as I said, uh, 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 he's going to be first speaker. Alexander is not uh, just a physician and scientist, but also an innovator and futurist uh, deeply involved in the cutting edge of uh, technology. Alexander currently is leading a figure at a Proven Solution. Um, he's uh, uh, pushing boundaries with virtual reality, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence to revolutionize uh, healthcare. Uh, his talk, uh, Technological and Biological Enhancement, Shaping the Future of health, Healthcare, I'm sure that uh, uh, will promise uh, to offer valuable insight into the future of medical science. So please uh, um, welcome Alexander Morozov. Uh, our uh, virtual floor is yours. Okay, great. I hope you see my screen. Thank you. Thank you for such uh, beautiful word, words. Uh, it's a, a great uh, honor to be uh, with you today. Uh, yes, once again, I'm Alexander Morozov, a medical doctor with a deep interest in medicine, te in technology and in progress. Uh, my experience spawns roles as a general practitioner, radiologist and consultant for IT companies uh, in the healthcare sector. Now uh, I'm working at the Proven Solution as a medical officer and the project manager who focusing on the project in virtual and augmented reality. Also, we're working with artificial intelligence and robotics field. 
So let's discuss the impact of technological and bioengineering advancements in healthcare, emphasizing the fusion of these fields. Uh, we will review the existing technologies enhancing healthcare, uh, future expectation, and bioengineering roles in addressing aging and rejuvenation. Uh, this discussion will highlight methods already improving healthcare and foreseeing an, uh, advancements in rejuvenation and treatments for incurable diseases uh, nowadays. So let's see how do technologies aid uh, in healthcare. There are two main ways. It's or improving the skills of medical workers or directly elevating patient conditions. So let's begin from the virtual augmented and mixed reality. Uh, virtual and augmented reality technologies provide a safe and controlled environment for training medical professionals. Uh, for example, with virtual reality, young doctors can immerse themselves in the uh, simulated medical scenarios that replicate real-life operating conditions without risking patients' lives. Uh, this allows them uh, to hone their skills before working with the real patients. We are working with uh, uh, different fields of medicine. Uh, it's from the uh, uh, where beginning uh, skills like auscultation. It's the science of hearing the different sounds. So for a little bit difficult skills like an ultrasound examination, computer tomography examination, and other. For example. Uh, we developed a virtual reality uh, application uh, to enhance medical students' uh, auscultation skills, offering them an opportunity to listen to various lung, heart, and abdomen sounds and understand their origins uh, in a dynamic organ model. You can see it on the screen. For example, student can at first uh, choose the, uh, what uh, organ uh, he or she want to hear and uh, then uh, choose the pathology and then to see uh, watch the mechanism of this sound and even see the different blood flow in the uh, organ and understood where it's going from. And our study, which includes control group, showed that the virtual reality improved ability to recognize pathological lung sounds by 43%, and the long-term retention of knowledge showed 120% better results in recognizing heart sounds. And of course, students like uh, high technology and uh, the satisfaction with the usage of virtual reality was pretty high. Uh, furthermore, in virtual reality training, uh, specialists can examine from all sides the manifestation of any pathology. Uh, uh, we can program clinical cases with any laboratory instrumental investigations that we can image. For example, now you see the example of our patient examination uh, application, where specialists can ask the question and patient will answer him with the voice and uh, see different examination, once again, auscultation, but more of them is different laboratory examination or even such a uh, uh, complicated examination like X-ray or even computer tomography. We also make the uh, uh, study in one university uh, where uh, took part also teachers and teachers also uh, highlight, appreciate, highly appreciate the contribution of this technology and the educational process. Uh, that immersion can also uh, train some skills in working with medical equipment, for example, with an ultrasound machine. Uh, young doctors also uh, understand a little of these gray spots uh, on the screen. Uh, but however, uh, the more times they see the real picture and correlate it with the sensor position, the better they will understand what they see. Uh, if needed, uh, we can even hint at uh, which organs they are currently looking at. Augmented reality. Uh, and the reality can be used to overlay important uh, medical information on the real world directly with colleagues, uh, even at the distance, uh, in form of the avatar, doctors can discuss real patient data or see some training simulators, like you can see on the screen. 
Uh, in the surgeries, this technology helps uh, in planning and conduct, uh, conducting complex procedures. For example, with uh, uh, augmented reality glasses, a surgeon can see K patient data in real time during an operation, improving accuracy and reducing the likelihood of the complication. Uh, for example, I working uh, with uh, one of uh, such application, I think five years ago, and indeed we see the good results for traumatological surgery. Uh, the time when surgery uh, use such technology time of operation was, was less, and the incision was not so big like without this technology. But unfortunately, there is regard to the another question that surgeon is not only very useful to guard this headset on his head, and it's uh, we got the question with sterilization. But nowadays we got some miniature, uh, miniature uh, headsets and uh, headsets that are available for sterilization in surgery con uh, conditions. Patient care. Virtual reality also has emerged as a powerful tool in healthcare, significantly reducing pain and anxiety during medical procedures for both children and adults uh, by diverting att attention away. Uh, from the real world. Its effectiveness is evident in reducing the need of anesthesia, especially in children undergoing uh, long interventions. Uh, this has been positively assessed by children, their parents, and medical staff. Uh, on these photos, uh, you see our two examples. In the two cases, uh, was girls who were afraid uh, doctors, but when in the virtual reality, they see some uh, animated character who say to them, open your mice or right, uh, mouse or rise a and uh, the doctor can examine this uh, child. Or uh, in the case of the child who was afraid of uh, vaccination, when she was in the virtual reality, she just made, oh, don't bother me, and without some screaming and without uh, something difficulties. Virtual reality greatly aids in cases uh, involving uh, psychoneurological development. Mm -hmm. We work with therapists who treat children with autistic spectrum disorder or and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and other disorders. In the real world, it's very difficult to focus such children on performing a single task required during therapeutic session. However, when the child is placed in the controlled conditions in virtual reality, uh, the situation changes and tasks begin to be uh, fully completed. The methodology uh, will de we uh, developed helps to uh, solidify the skills in real-world conditions. Thus, we observed such improvements as focus on the daily activities like reading, writing, uh, drawing, and learning uh, subjects, uh, we saw the improved speech and objectification. Uh, such child got uh, better uh, spatial orientation, enhanced motor skills, and as a general outcome, we saw the readiness of uh, such kids to join school with less or even no support from companion uh, teacher. And also uh, some application, like you see on the screen, this crossroading application, uh, help uh, such child to adapt to the conditions of the real world. Uh, virtual and augmented reality are proving beneficial in treating psychological disorders like post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and phobias by safety exposing patients to fear sources, aiding in overcoming and adopting them. These technologies not only make medical and rehabilitation process more engaging through gamification, but also promise to revolutionize medical practices uh, and education, improving healthcare quality and accessibility. For example, even such prim primitive technology as augmented reality in the smartphone was evident in some research researches. Uh, that it's uh, good for uh, treating the phobias, for example, uh, spider phobia and uh, phobia of the dogs. Let's go next, robots. 
Nowadays, uh, the interplay between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning ultimately leads to the working of robot in healthcare. Uh, robotic uh, technologies like Da Vinci system enhance, uh, it enhanced surgical precision, flexibility, and control based on traditional methods, even allowing remote operation. Uh, surgeons can stitch uh, with such robots very delicate, delicate tissues, such as uh, grapes, uh, skin from across the globe. Uh, these uh, robots are used for a range of different surgeries, including organ removal and hernia repairs, and such delicate operation like uh, operation on the zone of head and neck. Uh, and this is the precision that was available five years ago. Recent advancements uh, have introduced even more accurate tools, with some still uh, under evaluation. And additionally, data from numerous of surgeries is training neural uh, networks for potentially human-free operations in the future. For instance, uh, the Smart Tissue Autonomous Robot, OSTAR, has successfully performed laparoscopic surgeries on animal models, outperforming human uh, surgeons in some cases. And this robot uh, on an animal model uh, already performed one of the complex operation connecting two ends of the intestine. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, further boosts these robots by aiding in decision making and proving real-time procedural support. Okay, but in the healthcare we got another robots, not only surgeons. For example, autonomous mobile robots. Uh, they are being used in medical facilities for tasks like disinfection and delivering the medications. Or we got some uh, projects like uh, Spring that aim to assist the elderly and reduce the medical staff workload. Also, some robotic exoskeletons uh, nowadays improving rehabilitation by supporting mobility for injury or disease recovery. But industry specialists and futurists predict that in future, robots will become smaller and perform manipulations inside our body. Uh, microscopic drug delivery systems are being developed uh, that can uh, nowadays transport drugs directly to specific disease tissues, uh, minimize side effects on the healthy tissues, uh, on the animal models. Uh, this approach is still in the early stage, but promises to enhance the efficiency and safety of drug treatments. Uh, for example, uh, Bionaut Labs uh, developed micro-robots uh, for precise drug delivery and uh, to brain tumors and to treating one of the syndrome by puncturing cysts that block the flow of cerebral uh, fluid in the brain. Uh, these micro-robots can be made from uh, synthetic or biological materials, or a combination of both, and uh, many of them can be controlled externally using magnetic fields. Uh, also, some of them can move autonomously. Oh, another exam example is uh, the um, self-propellered robots for medical uh, delivery to a hard-to-reach places within the human body. Uh, during or oh, animal body, yeah, uh, because uh, during the research, a fleet of these uh, micro robots was used to transport doses of uh, some medicine, dexamethasone, into the bladders of laboratory mice and demonstrating potential for treating bladder diseases and other conditionals. Each robot measures only 20 micro micrometers wide. It's several times smaller than the width of the human hair. And nowadays, what we got? We got the primitive robotic systems uh, as small as 20 micrometers, and they already can operate inside bodies. Uh, if we compare it uh, with uh, human cells uh, in middle, it's four micrometers. What we can expect next? The size of such systems uh, will decrease to the subcellular level, uh, while their capabilities will increase. Uh, 
And uh, that's why some futurists believe that futurolo futurologist believes that by mid of the 2030s we will ha have medical nanobots that will allow us uh, to make uh, different things. For example, detect and eliminate more diseases at their earliest stages, or repair cells damage and malfunctions, slowing down the aging process, and even provides the possibility of significant extending human life. Uh, I will discuss this uh, damage that we need to change uh, in the second part of my lecture. Or uh, perform the complex surgical procedures, or even replace uh, our organs and tissues. Uh, however, um, this will be not the similar artificial organs, but rather the modification and enhancement of its functions. Um, for example, specialized uh, nanobots uh, may be developed to extract oxygen from air and remove carbon dioxide, uh, potentially replacing clunk function, such as uh, gas exchange and uh, blood pH regulation. Uh, this simplification overlooks uh, Lungs, um, it overlooks, yes, complex roles of the lungs, uh, but it highlights the potential for nanobot based respiratory uh, solutions. And uh, such solutions are nowadays described for any organ. Uh, the next thing is artificial intelligence. Uh, currently, artificial intelligence is making its way into medicine just as uh, in the all other fields. Artificial intelligence is advancing in medicine, enhancing uh, diagnostic by uh, identifying patterns in medical data, including MRI, computer tomography scans, X-rays, and which improves uh, early disease detections and diagnosis. For example, at this image, uh, you can see computer tomography scan uh, on the red uh, liver, uh, you can uh, see the green uh, tumor and uh, the artificial, uh, this uh, neural network are uh, highlight its changes. Or uh, some uh, 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 these algorithms are already used in the uh, computer tomography software and uh, highlight some changes and it's it is uh, much easier for specialists to find uh, these changes. Uh, also, some startups are leveraging AI to analyze patient data, genetics, lifestyle, medical history, uh, to tailor treatment plan as predict disease risk or um, uh, making a shift towards precision and personalized medicine especially if uh, these systems analyze non-stop incoming parameters, such as uh, heart rate uh, from the smartwatch, or in the future parameters from sensors that will be outside and inside our bodies, for example, to continuously monitor the content of various substances. substances. Uh, huge prospects are opening up in the discovery and development of drugs based on artificial intelligence. AI nowadays used to accelerate the drug discovery process by analyzing vast amounts of data to identify potential drug targets and model their effects. For example, uh, AI helped discover inhibitors for the Alzheimer's-related protein base 1, leading to novel treatment approaches for this condition or uh, take the example of the company in silicon medicine, which utilized AI to discover a drug for pulmonary fibrosis and reached the clinical trials in three years uh, since starting 2020. Because in the traditional way, uh, a traditional pharmacological way, we need 10 or 15 years before the clinical trials. Uh, additionally, in the collaboration with the University of Toronto, they identified a liver cancer drug just in 30 days and with clinical trial discussion in progress. And uh, some companies like Jero uh, now speaking that uh, their systems in future can even uh, found some anti-aging drug. Uh, also, artificial intelligence is being utilized to develop an ideal human model, incorporating physiological and biochemical aspects. Uh, this could help to predict drug effects and explore anti-aging treatments. 
uh, I'm by myself advising one startup on this project. And also, and I'm discussing with the New Jersey Institute of Technology uh, Simulation Laboratory, the creation of um, simplification model uh, for training medical and bioengineering specialists. But some huge startups and companies going further, for example, a couple of weeks ago, French startup uh, Bioptimus uh, received funding to develop a universal AI model for biology, aiming to connect all biological scales from molecules to organisms through generative AI, uh, with a commitment to open access and uh, community engagement. And just nine days ago, the neural network EVO1 uh, was introduced. It's uh, capable of generating and modeling DNA, RNA, and proteins, and uh, even at the genome scale. Many believe that uh, EVO1 will revolutionize disease treatment and uh, gene creation, enabling rapid testing in uh, simulations, uh, freeing scientists from years of tetanus work in laboratories, and with such neuronets, uh, neuronets uh, the creation and uh, extension of life is no longer uh, since uh, like science fiction. Oh. It's a very interesting topic nowadays, brain-computer interfaces and neurocomputer interfaces. These such interfaces uh, link the brain with computers logical, and enhancing medical treatments, rehabilitations, and life quality itself. Uh, Brain-computer interfaces uh, can read brain signals via electrodes, enabling control of device uh, through thought and stimulating brain regions. Technologies vary from low-resolution uh, electroencephalogram devices to precise implant sensors, uh, which despite the risk because they implant in the brain tissue, but they provide much more uh, precise interaction with uh, certain uh, neuron groups. Uh, other forms include the stentrode, uh, which is advanced through vessels to the target brain areas without direct implantation in the brain tissue. And all these uh, implants, all these uh, interfaces are already uh, used in uh, people. Yes, uh, many of them in experimental mode, but they are working. Uh, Neurocomputer interfaces uh, support individuals with disabilities by restoring functions like movement, speech, and even sensory abilities, creating new brain external world uh, communication pathways. For example, decades or we, of years, we got some cochlear implants that returned hearing, while other interfaces simulate visual pathways uh, for sight uh, restoration. For example, Alpha MAs and the Argos 2. Additionally, neurocomputer interfaces treat neuropsychological and neurological disorders like depression or post traumatic stress disorder through brain activity modulation. Uh, we can use some methodic from uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, but interesting approach is deep brain stimulation. For example, for conditions like Parkinson's disease, uh, where electrodes, uh, electrodes go in the brain, and it can reduce uh, symptoms like tremor in uh, even in medical resistance patients. And of course, uh, when we're speaking about brain-computer interfaces, we can't forget about Neuralink. Neuralink makes an advanced uh, neurocomputer interface with thousands of electrodes. Previously, all systems uh, in other companies um, made only with up to 100 electrodes, and the, but in Neuralink, it's thousands. And uh, one of uh, these systems is already had been implanted in the human for the first time. Previously, it was tested only on animals. And uh, by the way, two years ago, uh, there was a video of one monkey with uh, implanted Neuralink, who, uh, which can uh, play in this pawn game only with the power of uh, its minds, without some wires and other. Uh, 
One month ago, on January 29, it was revealed that a paralyzed volunteer nowadays successfully controlled a computer mouse and uh, was acquiring new skills through thoughts alone. Uh, it was confirmed that the participant recovered with no brain damage or side effects. But truly, um, we should say that such cursor control via the implant it isn't a new idea. It was first achieved in 1998, then furthered uh, in 2004 with BrainGate company and their interface. And uh, people with a neural interface from BrainGate uh, even enable uh, TV control and object manipulation. And uh, by 2018, uh, to paralyzed people with a brain gate uh, can send e emails one to other and use the tablet. But Neuralink novelty isn't in thought control interfaces, but in its wireless chip, eliminating wires. Because in this image, you can see the brain gate uh, neural interface with this uh, huge thing on the head and a uh, huge wire and only with the 100 of electrodes. And the Neuralink, you won't see these wires, and, but we will get the thousands of electrodes. And this is all just about reading information. Um, some specialists predict that the expansion of neuron detection could lead us uh, to advanced uh, neuroprothesis uh, within decades. And uh, if we will speak not about uh, only reading information, we can think, uh, uh, what if through this high density array of electrodes, we will start stimulating specific groups of neurons? For example, uh, activating uh, certain group of uh, neurons in the temporal area, and we will hear a specific sound or particular part of the postcentral gyrus, and we will feel some tactile sensations. And it will stimulate certain neurons in the visual area, and we will see something. Of course, initially there will be some flashes or of light or something incoherent. But technologies will not stand still, and when humanity can stimulate certain neurons in the certain sequences, if you remember, I started talking about virtual reality in the beginning and the convergence of virtual reality technologies with advanced full-fledged neural interfaces will allow us to create a completely experience with visual, tactile, auditory and even emotional, any, uh, that will be perceived uh, and as a real. And futurists say that we will have such technologies in 15 years. Let's see. Okay, uh, what I want to say also about these neuro things, neuro integration, neuro integration and machine learning are advancing limb prothesis that are thought controlled and can mimic touch and temperature feeling. Uh, some companies are developing a closed loop biomimetic neurorobotic prothesis with neuromorphic hardware. Uh, these prothesis have sensors in artificial skin to detect pressure, uh, feeding data to a neuromorphic chip. This chip creates uh, bio inspired neural stimulation patterns and emulating natural somatosensory processing. Adjusting neural stimulation parameters and the implanted neural interface channels produce natural activations in the residual nervous systems and make an electrically evoked sensation both uh, natural and uh, informative for uh, optimal sensory motor loop and that uses in prothesis. There are several of companies now working on such prothesis. And now we got the time to discuss bioengineering. Mm, by the way, in recent decades, uh, biotechnology has made significant progress in understanding the process of aging and the possibilities of increasing lifespan. More importantly, uh, humanity is now facing prospects uh, not only of extended life, because um, Few would want to be stuck forever in the old body of 100-year-old person, but also of uh, 
altering our bodies about aging or uh, rejuvenation. One moment, please. Okay. The significant recognition of aging uh, as a condition in international classification of diseases five years ago marks a pivotal shift toward treating aging as a medically addressable issue. Officially, this opens uh, new perspectives for researching aimed at understanding the mechanism of aging and developing effective strategies to combat age-related diseases. This recognition uh, stimulates funding for research in gerontology and geriatrics and contributing to the development of new therapeutical approaches and medical interventions. Uh, today, aging theories uh, diverge into two paths. One view it as a genetically programmed process prioritizing early adulthood uh, for reproductive uh, success while the other see it like an accumulation of damage or entropy over time affecting cells in the DNA. Um, but by the way, a couple of months ago, there was another uh, study, uh, another publication that's showing the information uh, theory of aging. And it's a pretty beautiful study because it links uh, all these uh, two theories together. Uh, now I want to give you an example of the second theory, the accumulation of the damages. For example, uh, from the earliest stages of our life, uh, there can be some uh, glucose pain cross-links between collagen fibers uh, of our skin or vessels. Uh, but they are so few that they practically have no effects. But as the body grows, these cross-links uh, accumulate by the age of 40 or 50, 60, it's depending on your lifestyle. Many people have so many of these cross-links that the collagen fibers uh, are more strongly bounded together and uh, making the skin less elastic. More critically, our blood vessels become rigid, uh, failing to handle with a pulse wave of blood, and it leads to the increased blood pressure, high risks of atherosclerosis, and other so-called uh, senile cardiovascular diseases. Again, uh, collagen is present in many structures of our body, and everything gradually degrades. Other accumulations of the mage lead to the um, emergence of other senile diseases, myasthenia, neurodegradation, and the general aging of the organism. Uh, this theory of the mage accumulations give us the basis for developing anti-aging therapies. Uh, let's look at the car uh, analogy. Uh, over the time, it rusts a little, uh, runs out of brake fluid and parts break. But if we will monitor the car and diagnose it uh, delicately and in a timely manner, as well as replace parts uh, that fail, um, then the car will be like a new. Uh, there are already cars that can be over 100 years old, but they still look and perform as new. So, now let's return to the human body. This diagram uh, you see represents the so-called hallmarks of aging, uh, which indicates the primary candidates in aging theory that have been discovered. We will briefly examine the first level of detail and discuss what uh, can be done about it. Stem cell uh, deflation. Uh, it involves undecorated cells that can divide almost indefinitely. Initially, embryos are mostly stem cells, uh, which then specialized uh, as the organism develops. Aging is marked by reduced cell regeneration, and notably in the long-lived tissues like muscles and nerves. Uh, for example, over 80 years, the human brain loses a third of its cells and affecting the remaining tissues functions. Stem cells therapy or tissue engineering and organ bioprinting uh, for transplantation are emerging uh, solutions. 
Nowadays, uh, the most well-known and regularly used uh, cellular therapy in clinical practice is uh, bone marrow transplantation. It allows uh, for the uh, creation of new blood and stem cells from transplanted stem cells, and it's really worked. And uh, more importantly, this uh, now it's feasible to transform any body cell, for example, skin cells. Uh, in, we can transform it to the stem cells, uh, enabling the generation of specific cells like neurons uh, that we can then implement in the same body. And since the cell uh, originates from the same organism, such therapy does not require suppressing of the body immune response. Uh, moreover, uh, there is already the capability to fill the 3D bioprinters with such stem cells, and not only stem cells, to print organs. Uh, research uh, have achieved su uh, success in the bioprinting various complex tissues, including skins, bones, cartilage, blood vessels, and even parts of organs like kidneys, liver, heart, thyroid gland. And these tissues show promise for use in the drug testing, disease modeling, and potentially even in future in transplantation. But by the way, some of the tissues and even thyroid gland was, uh, that was made in the bioprinter was transplanted to the animal models. And uh, the half of the transplantation was uh, uh, successful. Next theory is uh, senescent cells or zombie cells. Uh, our cells die in various ways, and this is a normal process. Some undergo programmed cell death, known as apoptosis, among other methods, uh, while the other can be destroyed by the immune systems. But aging is linked to the senescent cells, which uh, hold uh, division uh, but avoid apoptosis and uh, translations into a state where they don't function properly but release inflammatory factors. This is cause inflammation, weakening the immune systems and damaging nearby cells, spreading the senescence similar how the zombies infect others. Uh, high senescent cell counts in the tissues is heightened cancer risk and chronic inflammation, uh, undermining cell therapies in the elderly and uh, exacerbation conditions like arthritis and osteoporosis. But nowadays we go for uh, senolytics. Senolytics is uh, novel drugs designed to destroy senescent cells. Uh, they have shown the promising results in extending lifespan and improving health in animals studies, including the mice and dogs. Mm, benefits observed include up to 30% increase in lifespan, enhanced uh, cardiovascular, cognitive, and muscle functions, and slowdown in age-related diseases, and improvement in organ health and immune strength. Mm, early human trials indicate senolytics are safe and uh, may improve aging biomarkers with the potential to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But nowadays we need uh, additional uh, long-term, uh, additional researches to understand the long-term effectiveness because it's the new drugs. Uh, mitochondrial theory. Mitochondria is uh, the cellular power station. Uh, they have their own DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and but it's more damage prone than nuclear DNA. Uh, over time, uh, a disruption in mitochondrial DNA disrupts its functions, and the damaged mitochondria accumulate. Uh, it's uh, naming the clonal expansion and leading to cell dysfunction and increases the production of harmful oxidizing substances. Uh, methods to combat this include the gene therapy uh, to replace damaged mitochondrial DNA or mitochondrial transfer from young to old cells for rejuvenation and uh, transferring mitochondrial genes uh, to the nucleus for better protection. But uh, all these methods is still in the early stages. It promises to rejuvenate mitochondrial uh, function. Uh, we will see the results uh, of uh, such approach on the mice in the next year. 
aging theories like disruptions in the proteostasis or nutrient sensing uh, and intracellular communication uh, to aging overlapping, uh, it's overlapping with the theory of debris accumulation. For example, normally the cells managing uh, damage or redundant components through the lysosomes or enzymes, recycling or expelling them. However, uh, these substances uh, can form the resilient clumps like uh, lipofuscin. When it is uh, deposited in the skin cells, it gives uh, our uh, tissue a specific coloration. I think you probably uh, seen this in the, some individuals. But however, lipofuscin uh, does not only accumulate in the skin cells. Liver cells, muscle cells, neurons. Over time, lipofuscins appears everywhere, uh, occupying more and more space within the cell. Or oh, another uh, example, it's uh, uh, vitamin A derivative uh, form. Uh, it can accumulate in the eye. It's leading to the blindness in elderly. Uh, various strategies uh, we got how to fight with uh, these things. It includes the enzyme therapy and gene therapy to produce uh, new enzymes that can manage these clumps. Uh, and uh, the enzyme therapy effectively removing uh, this form of vitamin A from the eye. And it has already been developed and addressing this issue in the human. And clinical trials was uh, successful. Mm, discussing this uh, uh, extracellular debris, we focus on misfolded proteins like uh, amyloids and tau. Uh, it causing amyloidosis and tau pathies. Uh, for example, beta amyloid uh, known for forming plaques in the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer patients. It accumulates in everyone over time, mm, yet not all develop the noticeable Alzheimer due to the varying rates and quantities of these accumulations. The K ray research uh, avenues um, include the immunotherapy, how passive to active, or uh, targeting beta amyloid. Or nowadays, also uh, interesting uh, researches on the small molecule inhibitors to block production of this amyloid, and experimental methods uh, like gene therapy and CRISPR Cas9, or therapeutic uh, protein production, or genetic risk modification. Uh, additionally, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, interprotein crosslinks, um, notably between collagen molecules, it affecting aging by reducing el elasticity in organs, vessels, and skin. Uh, as I said, that glucose pain make up over 99% of these crosslinks. It leads to uh, decreased elasticity and vascular stiffness, and contributing to heart issues. Uh, but about nine years ago, Yale Spiegel Laboratory synthesized artificial uh, glucose pain. It was enabling the discovery of three enzymes that break it down. Uh, this led to the founding of Revell Pharmaceuticals some years ago, which is developing a drug targeting uh, glucose pain cross links and now approaching to human trials. And uh, uh, one of the last theories is genomic instability theory, which suggests that organisms lose the ability to repair damage to their DNA over time. Uh, mistakes in reading DNA uh, information can lead to various types of damage, including uh, uncontrolled cell divisions or the development of cancer. Uh, it's not surprising that uh, malignant tumors become more common with age, as this number of errors in genetic material increases. And this is directly related uh, to something very important and relevant today, the epigenomic theory. Uh, let me try to explain in the simple terms. We have DNA, which is programmed on uh, how patients work, uh, uh, how proteins work, and uh, how all the process acquire in our body. However, we have the same DNA in the skin cells, in the neurons, but uh, somehow these cells uh, behave completely differently. 
the reasons is that uh, methyl group and uh, some other changes are present on the different parts of the DNA in the different types of cells. And these changes is regulating the activity of the genes in the cells without changing the DNA sequences itself. Uh, it is that the epigenome is all about. Ep these epigenetic marks are uh, influenced by environment and age and dictate the gene expressions impacting cell functions and aging. Uh, over time, epigenetic information lose alerts and uh, lose cell identity and functions, leading to aging-related disorders, many of which I listed earlier. And uh, this is the point where all the theories, genetic theory and the major accumulation theory are linked. And recent experiments uh, show that epigenetic reprogramming using small molecules can reverse aging signs in human cells and in aged mice models, uh, restoring youthful epigenetic states and cell functions without genetic modification. Uh, for example, in an aged mouse model, uh, there were characteristic of physical and physiological changes, including alopecia, grain hair, hyphosis, uh, decreased body mass, movement, uh, and uh, decreased respiratory exchange ratio. However, after the application of uh, developed uh, substance, it was possible to reprogram the epigenome, and these uh, age-related changes were reversed. Uh, the mice fur become dancer, uh, the grayness disappear, and the muscle frame uh, strengthened, and behavior became more like that of young mice. And clinical trials of this approach on humans are planned to be conducted within the next five years. <laughs> According to the various uh, futurist uh, prediction and startups who are working with this technology, by 2035, we will have working therapies for each of these issues I mentioned earlier, uh, applicable to humans. And for some of these areas, clinical trials are expected to conclude in the next few years. Uh, of course, uh, this was a little bit somber. I quickly covered the main points that could transform healthcare and lead us to the radical extension of life. But each step, uh, each slide, each piece of information I mentioned today is deser uh, deserves its own conference to understand it even more or less fully. But if you're interested in it, I can recommend you to familiarize yourself uh, with uh, this publication to understand uh, all these biomar biomarkers of aging. Uh, or if you're interested in this topic, uh, I also can recommend uh, to uh, explore uh, these uh, sites because here you can find uh, many actual information. And it's crucial to emphasize that the progress in many fields is possible uh, thanks to an inter interdisciplinary approach that unites the efforts of professionals in medicine, biology, informational technology, ethics, philosophy, engineering, and many other fields. Uh, only through collaboration and knowledge instead, exchange between different sciences disciplines, uh, we can push the boundaries of what possible and move forward towards creating a healthier future for everyone. Oh, thank you for your attention. I hope I don't bore you too much. And I hope the lecture has inspired you to further research and reflect on how science and technology can benefit humanity. Take care of yourselves and maintain your health so you can wait uh, the implements of all these technologies in good spirits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Definitely, we are waiting for implementation of such technology. Of course, uh, on the on the other hand, uh, we have to um, also remember about uh, ethical issues and uh, you know uh, disadvantages of implementation of such uh, technologies. Uh, so, thank you for this kind of review of the latest technology in healthcare, medicine, bio, uh, biotechnology. Uh, I have to say that uh, I'm I was overloaded with such huge amount of data, and I'm impressed. But actually, I, 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 I'm sorry. I wanted just to speak yeah, about yes, the great, main things, but the main things is in every you know, topic. 
the, the, pres the, 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 the presentations uh, um, uh, we are going to, to, to record and also they are recorded actually and we are going to put to the uh, to, to, to YouTube for example so um, uh, our participants um, uh, will have uh, also opportunity to listen once again if, uh, if something was too, too complex to, to understand to, to catch it. Uh, but um, basically, you have painted a quite positive picture of, of the use of uh, new technologies in, in, in this field, uh, such as uh, medicine, biotechnology, uh, healthcare. Uh, and also, as I said, uh, your presentation definitely also raises uh, some, some questions, uh, ethical concerns, especially in terms of um, um, implants uh, or uh, brain-computer interfaces, right? This is the very, very controversial issue. But now, uh, because there, there is no room for, for questions, uh, but, but we will have time uh, for, for discussion during our, our upcoming um, uh, panel, discussion panel. panel. Uh, but now it's time for, let's say, um, uh, for a darker picture of innovation in medicine and biotechnology. Um, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Jennifer uh, Huberman. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, Professor uh, Huberman. Uh, professor of Anthropology at uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Her research, uh, her recent research uh, has explored the transhumanist movement in the United States and capitalism in the digital age. Uh, currently, she is working on a new book uh, that exam examines uh, the fragility of uh, friendship. Uh, but also, let me add that uh, her book, uh, Transhumanist from uh, Assessors uh, to Avatars, has recently been published in Poland. Uh, Polish title is um, Transhumanism od przodków do Avatarów. And today, um, uh, Professor Huberman uh, will delve into uh, such topic, the magic science and religion of pet cloning, and homage to Bronisław Malinos. Uh, it's a unique blend of anthropology and modern science reflecting on the Malinowski uh, legacy. So actually there is a Polish threat inside. Um, uh, so welcome, uh, Professor Huberman uh, to our forum and our virtual uh, floor is yours. Actually, our screen is yours. Thank you. Okay, so to share my screen, can you see, you can't see my slides right now, right? You can just press this button, this green one, and probably uh, will appear. Oh, the green, hold on, maybe. Can you see uh, my slides? No, no, no. Oh. Susanna, can you leave your... Hold on one okay, second. Okay. Um, okay, share screen. Yes, yes, exactly. And you can have you to, oh, Once again. <laughs> Continue. Uh, probably okay, here. open here once go. again by, by pressing this. Oh, yes, exactly. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> so now you can see it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, so first I would like to thank you, Conrad, for inviting me to speak. I am very excited to be here because my grandfather was from Poland, and I never imagined that I would have the opportunity to present my work at a Polish university. Uh, for those of you who are familiar or who are into classical music, I am related to Bronisław Huberman, who was a famous um, Polish violinist. Um, somebody was just asking me about that yesterday. So, um, But I'm also excited to be here because I think that the questions that are being posed in these human tech meetings are incredibly interesting and incredibly important. Um, how do we study the social and psychological impacts of new technologies. How are human beings using technologies, new technologies to enrich their lives? How do new technologies stand to destabilize the boundaries between life and death? 
And in my research on the transhumanist movement, I have addressed some of these questions. Uh, for instance, I've written about transhumanist attempts to achieve immortality through the technology of mind cloning. Transhumanists believe that we will soon be able to clone our minds and live forever in avatar form. Um, today, I want to shift gears a bit and I want to continue to explore how cloning is utilized as a technology of immortalization but instead of focusing on transhumanist initiatives, I want to turn our attention to a more mainstream practice, and that is the cloning of pets. And let me emphasize that I realize the topic of pet cloning is probably very far afield from what other presenters have covered in these meetings. But my hope is that it might help us spark an interesting conversation nonetheless. So the title of my talk is The Magic, Science, and Religion of Pet Cloning, an homage to Bronislaw Malinowski. Most of you probably know this, but Bronislaw Malinowski was a very famous Polish anthropologist who ended up emigrating to England um, and was sort of known as the founder of modern fieldwork. I am going to read my talk, but I'll try to do so in an animated um manner so you don't fall asleep. So a quarter century ago, when a Scottish you named Dolly first appeared on the world stage, cloning was both celebrated as a revolutionary techno-scientific breakthrough and lambasted as a blasphemous attempt by humans to play God. Indeed, the controversy surrounding the cloning of Dolly and the multiple debates it engendered is one of the reasons why anthropologists found Dolly so good to think with. The Dolly case invited anthropologists to consider how new forms of biotechnology are reconfiguring reproduction, kinship, and even conceptions of life itself. In the years since Dolly's debut, animal cloning has gone from a revolutionary scientific discovery to a mainstream commercial practice, frequently used to improve livestock herds or secure the genetic purity of a breed. In 2002, for instance, Blake Russell founded the biotech company Viagen. The company provides commercial bovine, equine, and porcine genetic preservation and cloning services, and it has emerged as a premier source of cloning technology for all non-primate species. As the company has grown, it has also diversified its offerings. In 2015, Viagen launched Viagen Pets, specifically to serve pet parents worldwide by providing them with genetic preservation and cloning services. For $50,000, pet parents can have their dogs or cats cloned producing an offspring that is genetically identical to the original. As the website explains, and I quote them here, dog cloning through Viagen pets presents an opportunity for dog owners to extend their relationships with their beloved pets. Dogs provide a unique form of companionship, loyalty, and love. It is difficult for many dog owners to imagine life without their dog. Indeed, many dogs become a member of the family. At Viagen Pets, many of us are loving dog owners ourselves, and we understand intimately the nature of these relationships. The company not only presents cloning as a viable way to continue a relationship with a deceased pet, it also suggests that pet cloning can offset feelings of grief and produce, quote, a love that will last forever. As the website advises, quote, the first step in dealing with pet loss is accepting that it's natural to experience strong feelings of love for your cat or for your dog. A second step is to consider pet cloning. Viagen Pets 
can help you with meeting the challenge of losing a pet and continuing that relationship through pet cloning. While the company stopped short of promising that the clone will provide an exact replica of the original pet's personality and demeanor, it does suggest that genetic inheritance is likely to produce a copy with many of the same key attributes. The website states, quote, we know that many dog owners have questions about cloning dogs. A cloned dog is simply a genetic twin of your dog born at a later date. The cloned twin will share many of the key attributes of your current dog, often including intelligence, temperament, and appearance. Via Gen's chief science officer, Sean Walker, echoes this notion. In a 2020 interview, he explained, quote, it's the same genetic makeup and genetics makes up all the characteristics of the animal. But what we don't know is how it affects behavior. I can say, however, that I've been overwhelmingly surprised at how much it appears behavior is controlled by genetics based on the feedback we get from clients. Taking Viagen pets as a case study and drawing upon client testimonials, in this talk, I want to explore how pet owners imbue clones with scientific, religious, and magical significance. In so doing, I draw inspiration from an essay that was penned long before cloning ever existed, Bronislaw Malinowski's essay, Magic, Science, and Religion. While much of the work on cloning has been informed by more recent developments in science and technology studies, I hope to demonstrate that this seminal text, written almost 100 years ago, still has much to teach us about the social and psychological significance of clones. So before moving on to analyze the client testimonials, I want to briefly discuss Malinowski's essay, and perhaps some of you are familiar with it, but I will provide a recap. Published in 1925, Magic, Science, and Religion was first and foremost a critique of the evolutionary paradigm. In contrast to anthropologists such as James Frazier and Edward Tyler, Malinowski argued that magic, science, and religion do not reflect different stages of the social and psychological evolution of man. Rather, they respond to different human needs, and as such, they can and do exist together in any given society. Whereas Levi Brule famously saw primitive man as ensconced in mystical thinking, Malinowski adamantly declared, and I quote him here, the view that primitive man has no rudiments of science, that he lives in a world of mystical or magical ideas, is not correct. No culture, however simple, could survive unless its techniques and devices, its weapons and economic pursuits, were based on the sound appreciation of experience and on a logical formulation of its principles. Indeed, for Malinowski, human beings' capacities to engage the world from a scientific standpoint and use reason and rationality to grapple with the empirical world around them is precisely what has rendered human beings more adaptable than other species. Whereas science responds to the need to understand, master, and control the empirical world around us, Malinowski argued that magic stems from a profound recognition that human beings are not in full control. It's a way of, quote, ritualizing optimism when confronted with situations that stand to undermine or overwhelm human intentions. So the classic example that Malinowski used um, that he drew from his fieldwork uh, with the Trobriand Islanders was that when the Trobriand Islanders would fish in the calm waters of the lagoon, they never invoked magic. 
but when they would venture out into the open and dangerous seas to go on longer fishing expeditions or inter-trade island expeditions, they always invoked magic. Now, although Malinowski critiqued James Frazier for his evolutionary paradigm, he did praise Frazier for brilliantly describing and exhaustively documenting the nature of magical thinking. For Frazier, and Malinowski agreed with him on this point, magic could be described as a form of pseudoscience that works to achieve a particular end through a faulty understanding of the laws of cause and effect. Malinowski wrote, quote, Sir James has shown that there exists a special lore of magical substances based on affinities, on ideas of similarity and contagion developed within a magical pseudoscience. So the classical example of this kind of magical efficacy or magical thinking that's based on ideas of similarity and contagion is the voodoo doll. The voodoo doll not only provides a likeness of the person to whom injurious effects are desired, but it also works because it contains a piece of the person in the constructed effigy. This might be hair clippings, nail clippings, or clothes. But the basic idea here is that what is done to the voodoo doll will be experienced by the person on whose likeness it is based. Now, to the extent that magical thinking is motivated by emotional needs, magic also shares an affinity with religion. Malinowski explained, quote, both magic and religion arise and function in situations of emotional stress. And for Malinowski, the fear of death was one of the main sources of religion. As he famously argued, and I'll quote him here, of all sources of religion, the supreme and final crisis of life, death, is of the greatest importance. Death and its denial immortality have always formed, as they form today, the most poignant of man's forebodings. And here, into this play of emotional forces, into this supreme dilemma of life and final death, Religion steps in, selecting the positive creed, the comforting view, the culturally valuable belief in immortality, and in the continuance of life after death. So just to recap, for Malinowski, magic, science, and religion were not competing forms of knowledge and belief, but rather complementary ones that each responded to a respective set of human needs. What I hope to demonstrate now is that Malinowski's distinction between magic, science, and religion, and the respective needs they each fulfilled, can be usefully applied to understand the phenomenon of pet cloning. However, I will also suggest that the world of pet cloning introduces some interesting differences in the way that magic, science, and religion operate in contemporary society. The ViaGen Pet website features more than 100 testimonials, or as the website refers to them, pet client stories. Almost all of the stories contain a photograph of the pet, a tribute to the animal, and some explanation for why the owner decided to have their pet cloned. The first point to note about these stories is that they are incredibly moving. I am not a dog or a cat person, but as I read through these accounts, the expressed feelings of love, loss, and gratitude brought me to tears several times. While some of the tributes feature pets who are still alive, most of them refer to cats or dogs who have already died and who have been or are currently in the process of being cloned. The pets are variously referred to as my baby, my child, my entire world, my soulmate, and even 
the love of my life. In other words, these testimonials make clear that in Western society, as many others have noted, pets are kin. They are regarded as beloved members of the family, and it is precisely through their abilities to make their owners or their pet parents feel recognized and understood that personhood is bestowed upon them. And I think this is an interesting point to think about because I think it raises some interesting questions about what are the conditions of possibility for human beings bestowing personhood on other non-human actors in the future? And maybe we can talk about that in the discussion. For instance, in a tribute to her dog, Ella, a four and a half pound Yorkie, one woman writes, Ella is our entire world. The day I brought Ella home was one of the very best days of my life. The second I stepped within a few feet of her, she nearly leaped into my arms, like she had been waiting for her mama to find her. After describing Ella's sweet and intuitive nature, the woman explains, quote, I know that I could never get this lucky again in a million years. This is why Viagen was a no-brainer for my husband and I. We are not having children, so Ella is our baby, and imagining life without her is unfathomable, but we know that life is finite. At first, I thought the idea of cloning a dog was wild, but I must say that simply knowing we'll have an opportunity to get her back, or at least her twin sister, when it's time for her to leave us, gives us so much comfort, it makes even the thought of losing her feel so much less devastating. In a tribute devoted to her little chihuahua, Nika, another woman writes, quote, People didn't invite me places. They invited me and Nika. She made my life so much better. She gave me a reason to keep going most days. This little chihuahua protected me from bears while camping and other more vicious predators while walking at night. When I had a human child, I thought I would love my child more and Nika less, but it never felt like that. The love I have for her feels the same as the love I have for my son. So her loss has been as devastating as I imagine losing my child would be. Life will never be the same without her, but the knowledge that I will soon have her twin or nearly identical daughter, a piece of her, it does so much to assuage my grief and pain. Yet another example comes from a woman who posted a tribute to her dog, Nicholas. She explains, quote, we met Nicholas during a fundraising event for dogs and he captured our hearts from that very moment. He came to our home the following day and the rest is history. He has a lovely personality and he behaves like a human. Nicholas has truly changed our lives. And as he's growing older, we cannot even think of losing him or living without him. We decided to research cloning and we feel it is the best way to keep him with us. The feelings expressed in these testimonials do make Malinowski's point that death and its denial in mortality have always formed, as they form today, the most poignant of man's forebodings. And yet, while these remarks clearly display what might be considered a religious impulse, that is, a desire to transcend the finitude of death, and maintain a connection with the deceased, they also prioritize science as the best way to do this. As Nicola's owner put it, we decided to research cloning and we feel it is the best way to keep him with us. Or as Layla's mother put it, quote, Layla was for me a best friend, companion, hangout buddy, relaxing partner. She brought so much joy and so little stress to my life. I know I will never be able to find that in another dog. 
That's why cloning makes so much sense for me. I'll see Layla again. And it's not some wishful, after we die, we meet again in heaven situation, but rather the factual occurrence of cloning her. I look forward to that day. The attempt to turn immortality into a techno-scientific fact rather than a religious endeavor is hardly limited to the world of pet cloning. As Abu Farman makes clear in his fascinating book on not dying, Secular Immortality in the Age of Technoscience, immortality projects have not only become, quote, a plausible part of the general techno-scientific imaginary, they are also now squarely part of Silicon Valley's cartography of power. The promise of using science and technology to render beloved pets immortal may be gaining quicker traction than initiatives centered on humans, but such efforts, particularly in transhumanist circles, as I noted earlier, are clearly underway. Moreover, both kinds of initiatives bespeak a changing division of labor in society, in which increasingly it is science rather than religion that is being called upon to counter the foreboding dilemma that Malinowski was so concerned with. In this regard, we might ask, to what extent has the science of cloning subsumed a religious function? In a society where pet deaths often go unremarked, does the science, or rather service of cloning, provide pet owners with a way to ritualize and honor the death of a beloved pet? While pet cloning clearly reveals a religious desire to immortalize a pet and maintain a continuing relationship with them, it is less clear how this process is facilitated and understood. How exactly does cloning provide a means to secure continuing bonds with a deceased pet? In what terms is cloning understood as a technology of immortalization? How is the continuing bond between owner and pet forged not only through the science of cloning and the genetic replication it makes possible, but also through the imaginative capacities and meaningful connections that pet owners bring to the cloning process? It is to these questions that I now turn. From the company's perspective, what is rendered immortal in the cloning process is the genetic identity or profile of the pet. Cells are immortalized through the technology of culturing. Explaining how this process works, they write, quote, the first step in having the option to clone your dog is to preserve your dog's genes through genetic preservation. Your veterinarian will collect a small tissue sample from your dog. This process is a minor procedure. That tissue sample will then be mailed to Viagen Pets, where we will culture new cells that share the same genetic makeup. We will then freeze these cells until you're ready to clone your dog. As noted earlier, the company suggests that genetic replication will entail a replication of other key attributes, such as the pet's temperament, appearance, and possibly even behavior. And yet, for many pet owners, the importance of retaining the genetic profile of their deceased pet does not seem to lie in the idea that it will generate a clone with the exact same personality or behavior. Indeed, most pet owners emphasize how utterly unique and irreplaceable their pets are. For instance, describing her dog Peanut, a woman remarks, quote, Peanut was one of a kind and can never be replaced. I know she'll be waiting for me in heaven, but now that I'm working with Viagen, I'm hopeful Peanut's clone will be close to her. Thus, what seems to matter most to pet owners 
is having an actual piece or part of their pet live on and being able to re-encounter that pet's image in the face of the clone. For instance, Lily's owner explains, quote, I've never had such a close bond with a dog, so I decided to have Lily's genetic information preserved. While there's no replacing her, it still brings me great comfort that there will be a part of her that will continue to live on in her future clone. Herbie's owner expresses a similar sentiment. She writes, quote, We've been blessed with many dogs over the years, all rescues. Each is special and unique, and those who have passed on are missed beyond words. As Herbie, who's one of our last surviving companions, nears the end of his life, we realize that we want to be able to keep a part of him with us. We became aware of Via Gen's cloning service and felt like this was something we really wanted to do. Jeremy Bentham's owner further emphasizes the critical importance of being able to encounter the face of his dog in a clone. He states, quote, if my boy Jeremy Bentham was a golden retriever, I'd probably just get a golden. If he was a great dame, I'd be buying those huge goofy guys every 10 years or so. But Jeremy Bentham is a mutt. All I know is I'd love to see a face that reminds me of my best friend someday. I know that until then, I'll be subconsciously looking for him in the faces of other dogs. Call it an homage. I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to do so through cloning. Similarly, Wolf Spain's owner also reflected upon the importance of being able to behold the image of her deceased dog. She writes, quote, Wolfie was born with severe subaortic stenosis and developed heart fa failure at only eight months old. He passed away one month after his third birthday. I was his foster parents since he was six weeks old, and we were only apart for one day since he came to my house. I officially adopted him at five months old. He's my special boy, my baby. I love him with all my heart, and I believe he loves me as well. I understand that his clone won't be him, but all I want is just to see him his physical form, hold him and kiss him one more time. Finally, reflecting on her desire to clone her cat, Bits, another pet owner writes, quote, I know that Bits is not a collection of cells, that she is every bit as much as a product of nearly two decades of love and interaction with us and the world around her, as she is her DNA. I know that genetically preserving her is not a way to bottle those experiences and revisit them on command. That would diminish their magic. I know you can't clone a soul and hers was far too unique to even imagine doing so. But what Viagen and their incredibly compassionate staff offers is an ability to intertwine the moments you've cherished so much in a familiar face with a new set of memories that will carry you into the future. While Bit's owner is concerned with preserving the magic of her experiences with her former cat, I want to propose that all of these narratives manifest a classical form of magical thinking. In all of these accounts, we find that the efficacy of the clone is predicated upon establishing relations of similarity and contiguity with the original pet. James Frazier famously proposed that these two principles constitute the basis of magical thinking. The first, he wrote, may be called the law of similarity, and the second, the law of contact or contagion. Frazier wrote, quote, 
From the first of these principles, the magician infers that he can produce any effect he desires merely by imitating it. From the second, he infers that whatever he does to a material object will affect equally the person with whom the object was once in contact, whether it formed part of his body or not. Right? Here's the efficacy of the voodoo doll that I talked about earlier. Although Fraser conceived of magic as a pseudoscience, pseudoscience that reflected the faulty reasoning of primitive people who misunderstood the laws of cause and effect, the anthropological record clearly demonstrates that such magical thinking lives on in contemporary life. Indeed, I am proposing that although pet owners themselves may not be able to articulate it in such terms, magical thinking, it can be detected in the various ways they attribute significance to the clone. If the peoples Fraser wrote about thought they could injure their enemies by destroying an image of them, pet owners seek to transmit love to the original pet by embracing the clone by casting their love upon a clone who bears the same image and possesses the same genetic profile as their deceased pet, they find a powerful way to continue the bond. Thus, although clones are initially produced in a scientific laboratory, I argue that they are only completed in and through the magical thinking of their pet owners. By bringing these principles to bear on the relationship with their clones, pet owners find ways to magically preserve their relationships with their deceased pets. Clones, therefore, may be more usefully conceptualized as living effigies that work to continue a relationship with a deceased pet rather than viewed as replacements for them. Indeed, many of these testimonials suggest that trying to replace a pet would almost be as blasphemous as trying to replace a child. As Lexi's mother writes, quote, Lexi was an incredible dog, loving and sweet. She was so gentle and kind to everyone she met. Lexi is one of a kind. She was always by my side whenever wherever I was, and had the best personality. Never ever did she disobey me or any of the family members in the household. She did things that I have never taught her and was the most well-behaved dog ever. I can't imagine life without her, but sadly, she passed away due to a heart condition known to her breed. I don't think I would ever want to replace her, but knowing that there's a service that can replicate her will mean so much to me and my family just to be able to see her again. So here again, we find that the desire to clone is not about replacing Lexi, but rather it's conceived as an effective way to maintain a relationship with her. By cultivating a relationship with the replica clone, who bears an uncanny resemblance to Lexi, and by um, containing part of her genetic profile, this bereft mother will be able to preserve a connection with her deceased pet and thereby actualize the promise that the Agen Pets Company promotes, which is, quote, producing a love that will last forever. So to wrap things up, Malinowski's essay, Magic, Science, and Religion, was written well before cloning had ever emerged in the world as a techno-scientific possibility in practice. Indeed, some might find the desire to return to his essay as counterintuitive, if not counterproductive. However, what I've hoped to demonstrate is that this century-old text still provides some useful and perhaps paradoxically new perspectives on the phenomenon of pet cloning. In concluding this talk, therefore, I'd like to discuss what I think this exercise has taught us. 
The first lesson to be gleaned is that from an anthropological perspective, cloning emerges as a fascinating topic of inquiry, not only because it enables us to question how new technologies are reconfiguring conceptions of reproduction, kinship, and life itself, nor because it helps us better understand the way technological developments take on different forms of cultural and political significance. These questions have been explored with great insight and dexterity in the anthropological literature. However, by bringing Malinowski's essay to bear on the topic, we arrive at a new set of questions about the way that pet cloning speaks to pet owners' psychological needs. As we have seen, the love bestowed upon pets makes their deaths absolutely devastating. And this engenders a powerful impulse to counter the finitude of death with dreams of immortality. Though it might be going too far to describe pet cloning as a form of religious practice, if we follow Malinowski, the impulse that animates this practice can certainly be thought of in such terms. The second lesson this case study imparts is that the respective psychological needs Malinowski associated with magic, science, and religion have not abated. However, what has changed is the way they are attended to. This case study suggests that the division of labor between magic, science, and religion is indeed shifting. As immortality becomes a techno-scientific project, science and technology are increasingly coming to assume a function that was once dominated by religion. And again, this is a point that Abu Farman makes in his fascinating ethnography of human immortality initiatives. Um, he proposes that techno-scientific immortality initiatives provide a privileged window from which to explore the tensions inherent in the age of secularism. And in many respects, Farman is correct in proposing that such initiatives do bespeak a more secular worldview. However, what Malinowski's work enables us to appreciate, at least when applied to the issue of pet cloning, is that even if science is being entrusted to solve the problem that of death and realize the promise of immortality, there is still something quasi-religious and even magical about the way all of this works for pet owners. Indeed, to my mind, the most interesting point to be gleaned from this analysis pertains to the way magical thinking is invoked by pet owners. While pet owners place their faith in science to deliver the clone, the efficacy of the clone is only secured in and through the magical thinking they bring to the process. For pet owners, it is not the science of genetic replication that is most persuasive, but rather the ability of cloning science to produce a copy who bears both a striking resemblance to the original pet and who contains a piece or part of them. In this respect, I have argued that pet owners do put stock in the principles of sympathetic magic and that clones might be better conceptualized as living effigies rather than as replacements. As Malinowski reminds us, quote, the theories of knowledge that animate magic are not dictated by logic, but rather desire. And the ultimate desire that pet owners express is to maintain continuing bonds with their beloved pets. Thank you. That's uh, it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, uh, especially for reminding us about Bronisław Malinowski, uh, famous uh, Polish anthropologist. It was in my opinion, great compliment to what Alexander was talking about in terms of uh, uh, pushing the boundaries in, in biotech, right? Um, and also you mentioned, uh, you mentioned some, some animals uh, and of course, I'm sure that most people here miss their pets and, and that have passed away, but it's of course uh, a question uh, um, about uh, whether cloning is the solution. 
um, uh, and and of course uh, we have to understand uh, people uh, people's uh, desires uh, needs. However, as uh, Asha wrote, uh, it's uh, tempting but uh, selfish, and uh, probably we will uh, talk about such uh, concerns uh, during our upcoming uh, panel. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, also. Um, what surprised me was the, the fact that you have uh, you have Polish rules. It's amazing, big surprise for me. Okay, uh, now uh, I would like to hand over a comment um, uh, of the rest of the meeting, uh, our meeting to Michał Matecki uh, from uh, Brain Store uh, Company. Uh, so, Michał, can you uh, introduce our uh, panelist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cornard. And uh, I'm pleased to moderate uh, this panel uh, today with distinguished guests. My name is uh, Michał Matecki. I represent uh, Brainstore um, as an international ex uh, um, expansion strategist uh, for uh, medtech companies uh, that want to, to enter Polish healthcare uh, market uh, with their innovations. Uh, let me introduce our um, uh, other guests today uh, who are joining the panel. Um, Joanna Andrusiewicz, a bioethicist uh, from the University of Warsaw. She's focused on the ethical aspects of uh, human and non-human uh, relations. And uh, a warm welcome to Jakub zawiła Niedzielski, a philosopher and welcome. Bioethicist from the also from the University yeah, of Warsaw. Uh, before we st before we start, uh, I encourage you uh, the, our audience to share their questions uh, over the chat. Um, uh, and now uh, I want to turn um, to the to our pan panelists. Uh, would you like to comment on uh, what we've uh, just had a chance to to listen to? Joanna, please. Thank you. Um, yes, um, Jennifer, thank, thank you so much for, for bringing this, this subject. Uh, and uh, uh, as I saw uh, a lot of, or at least a part of, uh, a huge part of our participants were uh, really into it. And um, um, what what I would like to, to add is that this is a very, very important part of your presentation for me from the ethical point of view is that there is a um, there is a huge huge difference between um between thinking about this new cloned animal as a replacement and as a new being who is uh, who is carrying a part uh, of this beloved one and at the same time um as one of the um, participants um, highlighted, there is this problem of high expectations at the very beginning of the uh, of of this new life. So uh, I think it could be ethically problematical, at least. Uh, but the other thing, uh, and this is so what I would like to to ask you, is I know we have. Uh, international consensus uh, that we are not cloning humans but uh, you know philosophers love uh, uh, thought experiments so I would like to to ask you and uh, to ask uh, also other participants uh, do they uh, do they think there is a, um, a real important distinction between uh, um, between keeping a part of our beloved one if he or she is a human in this way and um, between keeping a part of our beloved non-human animal if it would be possible just just like a little thought experiment. If it was, for example, our beloved ferret and our or a dog and our beloved grandfather. 
Thank you. Should I respond to that? Yes, yes, please. Okay, sure. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the transhumanists are arguing that we are going to be able to clone humans through the technology of mind cloning. And to me, as an anthropologist, what interests me um, is not so much the ethical issues surrounding cloning, whether it be in relationship to pets or in relationship to humans, um, but what I'm trying to do in this talk and, and what I've tried to do in my earlier writing on mind cloning initiatives is to demonstrate that even though we speak as if it's just a technological issue to be conquered, right? It's just about the science of cloning that will deliver a cloned pet or a cloned human, that there's always a symbolic maneuver that human beings have to perform in order for the clone to be um, compelling. So for instance, if you look at the, the transhumanists and their discussions of mind cloning initiatives, for them, the whole initiative is predicated upon the idea that we conceptualize the essence of the person as a mind, and that the mind itself is none, nothing other than um, a, a set of information, right? A, a code. And it's because mind is code, mind is information, that we will be able to transplant our minds onto a different kind of substrate, right? To my mind as an anthropologist, what makes that kind of thinking interesting is that on the one hand, it seems so different from the way that people have thought about immortality in a, from a religious perspective throughout much of human history. But it's really not that different. How much, how different is it to then saying, well, the essence of a person is a soul and the soul can live on in this other world. So to me, that's what I am continually fascinated by. I'm, I mean, I, I can barely operate my cell phone. I'm not into technology, but it's how these kinds of initiatives that seem very new, that seem very modern, that seem cutting edge are actually um, uh, similar to ways in which human beings have been grappling with these issues for thousands of years. So our our new magic and our new rituals. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Danny, uh, Magdalena Gabrish wrote uh, over the chat: uh, "Isn't uh, grief a part of relationship?" Uh, isn't a perspective of a fear of uh, of losing one, uh, in that case an animal, uh, makes us cherish moments uh, together? Yes, I think, I mean, I think this was also kind of Heidegger's point that, you know, death is the horizon against which life becomes meaningful and human relationships become meaningful. But I think that um, we also know, again, looking at many societies across time and space, that human beings, or even if we go back to the, the work of Robert Hertz, you know, a wonderful French sociologist, um, a nephew of Emile Durkheim, who wrote about mortuary rituals and why human beings require them. And he said, it's too much for us to accept the reality that one day someone we love, who is full of life, the next day is gone. And so we find um, cross-culturally all sorts of interesting ways in which human beings try to symbolically and ritually attend to grief. And part of what I'm suggesting in, in this talk today is that maybe cloning is the new ritual that we are turning to to try and address the grief that we experience when we lose a pet. I mean, if a child dies, we have a funeral. It's far less common for people, although it's not completely uncommon. People do sometimes have funeral for their pets, but it's not as ritually celebrated and marked. And so one of the things I'm curious about is to what extent does the science of cloning work to try and um, help people process their grief and also ritualize the death of a, of a pet? Mm -hmm. So we uh, we can use technology um, um, in situations when our mind struggles um, uh, to understand or accept uh, any situation. So the, the, to create uh, the magic, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, Jakub, uh, would you like to uh, elaborate uh, on this a, a bit? Yes. Um, well, uh, the two things are striking for me. First of all, uh, how um, magical is this thinking, and in both on both sides, the uh, the the so called uh you know transhumanists and the people who, who want to clone their pets um because this is not how uh actual neuroscientists think about how minds work right uh, i mean in philosophy of mind we would say that this kind of dualism is just ancient basically it's it's outdated completely and uh and uh, something more modern includes both embodiment and you have embodied minds or uh, or um uh, and kind of thinking bodies or think something like that so so this is very interesting how uh people who are so supposedly so connected to technology are so kind of outdated in their thinking in a sense that's one thing that's very interesting for me but uh, the second thing i wanted to point out i was hoping that uh that joanna would mention this but i i think this is something we should we must mention here is that we uh it, it's very strange that uh people who care so much about their pets or their close ones uh treat them in such a like things basically like you can uh you can have a new one and uh and treat it as a replacement so it's almost like a commodity and uh and this is uh and this this whole promotion of this idea is for me is quite shocking that those new clones don't have their personalities of their own or the kind of life of their own in this anthropological uh approach uh that you presented somehow uh they 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 become like symbols, but not living beings with their emotions and, and feelings and everything. And this is something that's uh, completely, for me, uh, kind of uh, uh, scary when we think about that we could go to humans and uh, have replacement humans that are kind of supposed to behave like uh, their previous genetic templates or something like that they are supposed to have certain traits and so on it, it's kind of uh, um, uh, problematic and this this kind of uh, symbolic life extension in humans would be uh, something very scary even though i think it's scary in pets already uh, e even even if somebody doesn't kind of set, subscribe to full uh, agent uh, agent agency for for uh for animals like dogs or uh or uh, cats even then this is scary I if you subscribe to like a little at least some agency for them then it becomes much more problematic Danny, mm -hmm. would you like to comment on this okay sure yeah thank you um first of all i completely agree with your comment about the transhumanist conceptions of mind and how they leave out the body and all of those things. Um, I guess from um, an anthropological perspective, my interest has never really been in, in sort of interrogating the veracity of their scientific claims, but rather understanding the kinds of assumptions that they make that would enable them to propose that mind cloning could be possible. Um, I think that if we had, you know, neuroscientists in the room looking at their the claims that they're making and the way that they conceive of the mind and the mind is disembodied, there would be a, a lot of debate, right? Um, second, I, I I really appreciate your your point about why this pet cloning could be disturbing and how it's sort of um, presupposes almost this willingness to be able to commodify a, a pet that you at the same time claim to love and think is this unique, wonderful, special animal. But what I would also say is that this is one of the reasons why I think it, it's an interesting topic to focus on. At first glance, I, I came up with the idea for this topic, topic and I was like, this is ridiculous. Who wants to hear about pet cloning? This is so silly. But to your point, I actually think that it gives us an opportunity to anticipate um, what debates around a possible future human cloning might look like. And I think that because this is becoming mainstream much more quickly than initiatives geared towards human beings, 
that all of us anthropologists, bioethicists, you know, should be paying close attention to what's going on. The other thing I would say is that my sense, and I didn't talk about this in my discussion today, but um, it's something I've been thinking about, again, gets back to the difference between a willingness to clone one's pet versus a child. And there's a part of me that thinks that the desire to clone a pet um, is not just about a, a way to attend to the grief of losing a pet, but it's also a way to attend to people's um, death anxiety, that pets live for 10 years, 15 years, right? And so you come to measure your life in a certain sense through the lives of the pets you've had. I have a crazy uncle, Richie, who has had a dog named Char. He's gotten four more of those same dogs, Char 1, Char 2, Char 3, Char 4. He names them the same. And when I look at that, what I see is an attempt for him to rage against the reality of death. And 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 seeing his reflection, I mean, we have, could have a whole discussion about the way that pets operate as self-objects if we wanted to take a psychoanalytic spin on things. But what I see him doing when he gets the same dog, you know, time after time after time again with the same name, I see him fighting against his own morta mortality, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And, um, I'd like to pivot uh, for a while to, to Alexander. Alexander. Yeah, but, you know, uh, sorry for the interrupt, interruption, but I see that Joanna is, is raising her, her hand. Oh, yes, please, please. Sorry. Okay, so maybe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad, and uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you for giving me the voice. Um, I, I would like to comment uh, what what Jakub said, because um, maybe may maybe my assumption was wrong, but uh, uh, from what I heard uh, from from Jennifer's presentation, was the uh, the love and the hope uh, and the grief of those. Uh, those those people and uh, when Jennifer uh, told us about this crazy uncle, that was the kind of ob objectification of animals of non-human animals uh, that Jakub mentioned. But what I heard before was was a lot of love and hopes, and uh, I really didn't think about it as an objectification of animals. I thought it was. It was useless. It was pointless because it is uh, uh, it is uh, some kind of delusion that we uh, we okay in a biological manner we are keeping a part of this pet, but you know uh, uh, it it is um, maybe it is more um, more selfish to clone one's uh, pet than to. Uh, it is probably more selfish to to clone one's pet than to uh, adopt from from a shelter, uh, but I don't think it is uh, it is uh, objectifying them. Not in a way I am thinking about uh, objectifying of uh, objectification of animals. We see. Uh, in uh, in case of a lot of practices uh, we uh, we are um, we, we are using towards animals like uh, in a, uh, we use them for food we use them uh, in um, experiments we we use them for clothing etc etc so uh, it was not the case for me but maybe alexander could uh, could uh, verify one thing for me because i know in when we when we face the case of cloning we have also some problems uh, with um possible um biological outcomes like shortening of telomeres and uh, things like that so maybe this is the aspect of cloning which uh, which is leaning towards objectification of animals alexander could you help me Yes, there was some problems like the longest of telomeres in the uh, first ones, and the, uh, also was speaking that the clone, for example, of the dolly sheep uh, was uh, problems with the uh, ankles, with the different joints and other. 
But uh, then it was understandable that the problems of the for, in the joints was from the perspective of the life life conditions of such animals because they live in the uh, another conditions uh, neither the uh, dolly itself and uh, but from other perspective. Uh, uh, questions with telomeres uh, nowadays is have a solution because uh, we got not one uh, tactics of cloning but uh, different uh, uh, different operations for this and for example even uh, i think four or five years ago there was uh, first cloning of primates uh, primates uh, uh, monkeys in the uh, china and there was uh, all different uh, new cloning tactics to achieve this so but yes it uh, we should to understand that there is some consequences uh, and the cloning it's not so simple idea that we can clone the human tomorrow or something like this thank you uh, Alexander, um, you have shown us uh, a cross section of uh, the advanced technologies that are being developed. Uh, perhaps some of us uh, are not even aware of uh, how many futuristic uh, projects uh, in medicine are already advanced and how they can change our lives very soon. And it's not just AI uh, that is uh, buzzword now, but uh, in context of your involvement uh, with uh, the Pro Proven and, uh, and Reality Project um, and your recent uh, co-authored publication on VR for children with uh, spect spectrum of uh, disorders, uh, what key challenges do you face in integrating VR into daily therapy and adopting this technology in general uh, for medical uh, medicine, medical purposes? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, indeed, we are working with uh, some specialists, uh, therapists who are working with uh, children with secondary logical disorders, and uh, we are applying uh, the virtual reality as a tool of the treat treatment. Uh, once again, a virtual reality is uh, not the universal uh, treatment options, it's just a tool, and in the good hands of good specialists, it can be a very useful tool. Uh, uh, I want to write if there is one hour sessions per therapist with child, the virtual reality sessions is only five or ten minutes, uh, not more, but it's enough. Uh, the main challenges, it's not even from the position of child or parents, because uh, parents are happy when they see new technologies uh, in uh, working uh, with the child. Uh, child, of course, uh, the, especially child with autistic spectrum disorders, uh, the, uh, disorders they are a little bit afraid of this uh, headset and other, but uh, we made uh, the guidelines how in playful manners, like a game, uh, start to use it. But the main challenges, it's uh, from the perspective on uh, uh, some conservatory uh, views of the specialists who are uh, decades working uh, with uh, uh, one program with the child and uh, don't know how to um, implement these new technologies in the practice. And uh, also um, convincing the different centers, uh, centers in Poland, what I'm do doing right now, and specialists to adopt the virtual reality methodologies uh, had been challenging. But initial resistance usually gives way uh, to enthusiasm when the innovation upon ex uh, experiencing we are uh, for first time, when they just uh, one time uh, looking at this uh, tool and understand what it is, that it's not just some game or something like this, but it's a good tool. Uh, then the, most of the specialists uh, uh, agreed that it can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it's very uh, good that we can uh, adopt uh, to any child the environment, virtual reality, and uh, all that we need. Mm -hmm. do, do you envision uh, VR uh, becoming a standard soon in broader medical fields, not, mm -hmm. not, 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 not only this? 
Uh, it's hardly to say because, yes, in some fields uh, it's very helpful. For example, in rehabilitation, I didn't speak uh, uh, a lot about it, but uh, there are some researches uh, that showing that people with much more desires uh, after strokes or after injuries make a rehabilitation in gam gamification manner, where they need not just uh, raise up their hands, but uh, took some virtual objects uh, or virtual fruits and to give to some virtual creature, something like this. And uh, I even see some uh, interesting uh, uh, applications uh, when people are trained to control the newest uh, prosthesis with the help of virtual reality. In virtual reality, they train their muscles and uh, in the uh, empathy uh, uh, limb, uh, how to contract something, and in virtual reality, they much easier and in interesting uh, gamification manner can control these virtual prosthesis. And then in real life, they much more easier control this new prosthesis. So I think in rehabilitation, it will be pretty soon. In uh, surgery, by the way, when I speak about uh, these surgery robots, the surgeons who operate on them, they see it on the glasses in the virtual reality, you can say, it already implemented. But in other fields, I think it will be faster going to the uh, uh, psychology treatment of different psychology disorders and to the educational field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let let me ask you one question. I noted uh, before uh, from our audience. Uh, Maya Ben is asking: Will extending life also uh, go hand in hand with increasing quality of life? I think it's very important uh, question. But quality of life uh, it's uh, uh, not so linked with all these uh, therapeutic techniques, and it's uh, very cross disciplinary uh, questions where we should involve. Uh, already now, we should involve the, uh, some people who make decisions in how we live in the cities, in the countries, uh, because when we face it in 10, 20, 50 years, uh, we need the answers uh, how to raise quality of life because it can be many questions. But I believe that, yes, uh, uh, that uh, dedicated persons will find the good uh, options how to improve the quality of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In any conditions. Yes. Uh, Joanna, um, we are uh, aware that some of innovations that Alexander mentioned uh, before uh, involve uh, clinical trials on animals, such as uh, Neuralink, for example. Uh, what is your comment uh, on this? Uh, in light of um, the advancements in medical technology, technologies um, that promise extending uh, human life, um, how do you see ethical boundaries evolving between live beings uh, like humans and non-human animals? Uh, a question to, to, to Joanna, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for this question. I can see, uh, I, I think it could go in different directions. Um, first one is uh, maybe the most probable. Um, it is uh, this that we um, uh, we are uh, we are going farther and farther uh, in separating our better moral st status of humans. So we are we are the ones who who make those really really amazing discoveries. Uh, we are doing research, and now we are humans plus. You know. Uh, so and uh, the, the moral status of animals and our treatment of animals is degrading and degrading and degrading. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, it could go in a different direction because uh, maybe the some of those technologies will be um, will be uh, within the reach of only some humans, those who have resources like money and uh, this would mean that we could have for example uh, new moral uh, new moral boundaries we, we can have humans humans plus and non-human animals maybe separated in a few new categories uh, so 
I think both pathways are quite probable. I don't know how the rest of panelists think which one is uh, um, is more likely to come, uh, but uh, it could go at least in those two directions and maybe in e even more. And I think that there is also this um, this danger that uh, we will when when we could live longer and be uh, healthier for a long, long, long time, uh, we could value human life even more, and uh, it could reinforce uh, some uh, some um, non-humane species, uh, even attitudes towards animals. So. Uh, on the one on the one hand, this is this is so tempting, but on the other, uh, I think we should be aware. And uh, as Jennifer said, we can think before um, about those possible outcomes: the good ones, the bad ones, and the ugly ones, and discuss them now. Thanks. Jakub, um, the pursuit of longevity, uh, what ethical considerations should guide us, uh, in your opinion? Um, pursuit of longevity, well, I, I, I see a couple of problems with, uh, with that. Uh, there is, of course, like the, the general uh, idea has been floated for hundreds of years that, you know, that it would be, some people would say it would be great and some people say like the life would not be worth living past some age because you wouldn't experience anything new i wouldn't like to talk about that because it's it's too let's say distanced from uh, uh from what we're talking about today but uh what i'm thinking about uh the most when i was thinking about this topic of this panel i was thinking about this uh culture clash between two um let's say areas uh one coming from the tech industry and the other coming from uh biomedical research so in biomedical research traditionally you have this kind of slow development improvements and uh you have uh, at least since uh, 1940s you have uh, all those ethical and legal regulations very strict and so on and then you have this culture of disruption you have uh, people coming from tech industry people coming from biohacking and and such areas who kind of want to disrupt disrupt everything have this jump in technology kind of uh, uh, throw in everything and uh, i think that this is a uh, huge um challenge from both let's say bioethical point of view but also i i can change my cup so to say i i'm also uh i also kind of done some work in management and it's also kind of of culture uh and management culture problem because uh you have those two types of thinking that in the same place and it's very hard to kind of make them mesh together and i think this is uh this is potentially uh can can be catastrophic can be kind of kind of there are some opportunities in this i think that, that there might be but uh it will be very challenging to make this work uh in a uh, in a good way and uh what i'm worried as a bioethicist is that um all kinds of uh, IRBs or uh, research ethics committees, depending on which side of the ocean we are, uh, are not prepared for this kind of uh, uh, for this kind of uh, problem. Like if they are approached by research projects regarding some disruptive technologies, they might not see them uh, in a correct kind of way and understand what they're about. So this is something that's uh, that's a very kind of uh, I, I see as a problem in general with uh, the research cultures. And one more thing uh, I wanted to add because this is something I I, I think is very important to mention today is. Um, a problem that has been growing over the last couple of years with uh, kind of life enhancing implantable technologies, especially a uh, problem that's kind of uh, connected to how our, our uh, economies work, basically. Uh, what kind 
the problem of long-term support for this kind of technologies. For uh, the good example that you might have heard of is uh, the uh, vision prosthesis devices that basically the company went out of business and people lost their eyesight uh because there is no support for it anymore and uh this is something that will happen as well with some uh, let's say nano uh nano robots or things like that where you will have somebody some startup that comes up with something great it actually works but for some reasons regulatory or business or whatever they cannot continue in this business and then what and who is responsible for that a government some international bodies who actually is responsible for uh, sorting those pr problems like so there's a problem for having a regulation that doesn't stop innovation at the same time makes it let's say basically uh, responsible at least in a minimal sense and it's very very hard because uh, uh, as i said before uh, the culture of let's say bioethicists and people who re who are used to uh kind of talking about this kind of regulation so let's say bio law people want to be kind of easily adapted to to this kind of new technologies so so uh, there's a lot of problems and we will be kind of walking into this minefield and i think uh we will see more mines in the future than we see now and it will be more and more of them uh, maybe Alexandre, would you like to comment uh, uh, the, the statement representing technology, uh, Ria? No, I uh, totally agree that there are a bunch of different bioethical problems that we need to solve and when to speak about it right now. Uh, one of the um, interesting things uh, that uh, Joanna mentioned is affordability of such technologies. For example, if uh, in the nearest time there will be some new neuro uh, interface or something, who, who can afford it? Uh, of course, at, uh, from first perspective, it will be for uh, very wellness uh, people. But uh, as I see for different even or uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, perspective or for technological perspective uh, nowadays we need two or three years to make the copy maybe at first it will be not so brilliant copy but in a couple of years it uh, became better and better and the, for example the chinese nowadays make a copy of the brilliant robots like boston dynamics robot in one year who can make the, all the same things and uh, the some biohackers group now uh, uh, analyzing the spectrum of different uh, new drugs and make the replica of these drugs that on, on biochemically is it identical to these drugs. That's why I think if there will be some disruptive technology, it won't be forever with just uh, wellness people if they uh, want to just uh, not sharing it with anybody. Because uh, if uh, the example of this drug, of if this technology will come to the dedicated persons with good knowledge in biochemistry or technology, we can make a replica of this. That's why I don't think that it's a very crucial problem. But what about the all another problem? It's uh, I, I don't have answer nowadays, and we need to discuss it more, of course. Yes, thank you, thank you, uh, Denifer, uh, Would you like uh, Would you like to um, um, take your point of view on this on this discussion? Um. Sure. I mean, I, I agree with what Jakob was saying that I think, um, and I, I really appreciate the sort of two cultures point that he made and the rapidity with which these, I mean, you can call it disruptive technologies. I think the people in Silicon Valley would say innovative. Innovation is a, an ideologically loaded word for plowing straight ahead with changes that stand to affect millions of people's lives without any kind of um, weigh in from uh, larger governing bodies or, or citizens. There's actually, I don't know if you've read Jason Sadowski's book, Too Smart, which is about how digital capitalism is taking over the world. But this is a lot of what he talks about, and it's a, it's a wonderful book. And um, I think that it is a challenge. And I think that it does 
you know, we as, as a society have to have some more robust conversations about do we feel comfortable letting these tech giants in places like Silicon Valley sort of steam ahead and try and convince all of us that these are the innovations that are going to make our lives better, we're going to live longer, it's going to, you know, enhance our existence without really slowing things down a little bit to ask what are the implications of this? Or as Jakob was saying, what happens when you've, um, you know, outsourced your your eyesight to another platform and the company that started it goes down the tube? So they're complicated. Um, and I think that's why these human tech meetings are important. But I am going to have to go because I have to teach my my class. <laughs> Okay, of course, one, we but I have to go it, to the so... second one. But thank uh, you, everybody. It was thank such you a very pleasure. much. It was a pleasure you. having you here. So enjoy your day, enjoy your class, and I hope to see you in future. All right. Have a wonderful discussion. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So, so Conrad, uh, I can see that uh, we are uh, running out of the time, but uh, yes, 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 yes. The, uh, exactly. So, uh, of course, if, if there is, there are some uh, new questions or comments, or maybe uh, someone uh, wants to add uh, something to to our discussion. So, free to do it. Uh, if not, of course, uh, we will. Uh, uh, we'll around to close our meeting, but uh, let's say last chance to uh, to add something uh, to to contribute to our discussion. Um, um, so uh, I just want to share with one interesting idea, also that I didn't mention at, at the, during the lecture. That nowadays I saw not only the involved was and even involved in some startups who work in, in reproducing the physiology of biochemistry, but uh, some startups trying to analyze all the uh, parameters of the brain, emotion in the uh, nonstop time and make uh, some generative AI, but consciousness and emotional AI. And uh, I think it's also a very interesting topic because they uh, not only uh, copy all the messages from the persons so like uh, making another uh, com companies and making digital twin, but also seeing the electroencephalogram, what making all his its emotion faces. And uh, from my perspective, also what direction we can see in the nearest decades, it's uh, the understanding of the nature of consciousness, because I think it's one of the greatest uh, secrets <laughs> that maybe someone, uh, some days we will find the answer on that question. So, yes, so yes, a, a short wrap up uh, by uh, Joanna and Jakub, uh, just to finish the discussion, and then Conrad, please, uh, please uh, uh, introduce uh, the other events upcoming. So, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, as I as I as I uh, uh, paste into uh, chat uh, space uh, information, it's it's unofficial actually. Um, uh, information about our upcoming event. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the, uh, as you can see, in March we will have another meeting, and to some extent, I think it will be continuation of our today's meeting because we are going to to talk about cyborgization, cyborgs among us, ethics, identity, and future of human evolution. Uh, so I'm really excited um, about this event, and I think uh, you will be satisfied because uh, we also are, we also plan to touch some ethical uh, concerns. And uh, Rebecca Gibson um, and also Alexander Lukashevich um, Al Alcaraz, um, uh, they, they, they both. Uh, wrote, uh, published books, interesting books regarding uh, cyborgization, this kind of process of cyborgization and post-humanism. Uh, so I, I expect uh, an interesting discussion. Uh, so um, stay tuned and and uh, uh, 
I, I really encourage you to, to follow our channels, our social media channels, because uh, we inform uh, about uh, our conferences and uh, about our um, uh, meetings. Um, so as I, as I said, uh, now it's uh, only uh, this, this kind of poster, but uh, in the next upcoming days, you will see uh, more details uh, on our, our website, uh, SWPS uh, University, and also uh, Human Tech uh, Center. Uh, so, um, and also, uh, mm, uh, uh, we would like to ask you uh, to fulfill our questionnaire, um, a short questionnaire about our uh, today's event and uh, about your uh, expectations uh, regarding next uh, events. Uh, for us, it's great to have kind of feedback and to improve maybe something. And maybe if you have some uh, ideas, uh, what kind of uh, new topics uh, should we introduce? Uh, should we, you know, uh, elaborate? Uh, so uh, it would be nice to know uh, what you think about that. So uh, thank you in advance for that. And uh, thank you, um, all of you, for your time. Uh, it for me was for me was great pleasure uh, to to listen and to participate in this event. Uh, and uh, of course, there are lots of uh, uh, because there there is ongoing debate. It's so hard to find uh, answers, right? We have a lot of questions. We have we see a lot of dilemmas. However. There are a lot of um, problems, a lot of, um, uh, still we are, <laughs> we are searching for solutions, right? And, and answer, what can we do in order to, uh, to, to take into account our people's needs, right? And also uh, psychological uh, needs, because for example, in terms of cloning, we, there are lots of also psychological uh, problems uh, related, uh, related to, uh, for example, um, uh, missing our pets, right? Some sometimes uh, for for people it's so hard to uh, uh, to to live without uh, their uh, um, pets. So there are lots of pr problems. Uh, so that's why, as I said, uh, we have uh, also this plans to 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 continue and to analyze um, this problem of human evolution and also. Uh, related to technological progress, right? Because it's everything about technology, about uh, um, technological um, uh, changes and emerging technologies. So please uh, uh, follow our uh, channels and, uh, um, and stay tuned. Uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, have a nice evening, <laughs> the rest of evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Nice.